Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Martin, and this is William Eder. And today we're going to be talking about RAVEN, the Remote Autonomous Vehicle Explorer Network. Uh, so just briefly, our agenda for today, we're going to go through the motivation for this project, uh, our leader follower configuration, which we'll get into, uh, the model of verifying our system, our experimental architecture, a short demo, and some concluding thoughts. Uh, so a brief motivation for the project is search and rescue. Um, and, and that is that uh, recently a study came out that said there's only 72 hours time in which to find a search and rescue victim before the probability of finding that victim drops to near zero. And so uh, environments where traditional, which is to say human performed search and rescue is too dangerous, uh, it's impractical, or it's just otherwise uh, too large, which is the, the area is too, too large for a human to explore in, in the time you need. Uh, these are the applications, these scenarios in which we're trying to uh, improve. So search and rescue, robotic search and rescue, is not a new idea. It's been around for a little while. and In fact, CRASAR is the Center for Robotic Assisted, Assisted Search and Rescue. On the left here, you see a ground robot. That's CHAOS. And on the right, you see AeroScout. That's an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV. And that's also, these are two commercially available uh, platforms for search and rescue. We're going to be targeting the right side, the UAV uh, scenario, um, because that's, if you want the fastest response time, that's what you're going to be targeting. And we're going to be using what you see here, which are four rotor helicopters, uh, commonly called quad rotors. Uh, just to continue on the motivation, you might picture a firefighting team that's going into a burned building, a downed building. They might have a map that's 10 or 20 years old. So then the problem becomes, how do we map out uh, this? How do we give these firefighters a new, uh, a new updated map so they know what they're getting themselves into? And this is a video. This is from Grasp Lab just upstairs of a quad rotor. You see this in the, in the red right here. And it's flying through inside a building, and it's mapping it out in real time. So you can, there's definitely the technology, the software, and the hardware to do stuff like this. But what you'll see in systems like that and other systems is that if you're flying UAVs, aerial vehicles, you probably only have one. So how do we expand that to two, or how do we expand that to N? And so what we're getting into is this flocking, this swarming. And the idea is that if you have more than one, then you're acting like a human team. You have collaboration, redundancy, uh, and uh, you can come up to some consensus about the environment that you're exploring. So I'm going to pass it off to Bill right now. He's going to talk about Raven, which is our custom quad rotor build. Thank you. All right, so on the screen, you actually see only a single quad rotor, but we do have two as well as uh, enough equipment to make a third one. This is Raven, which is our quad rotor platform that we're using. And it's a custom built, which means that we've spe uh, specifically designed and selected the components, which are all off the shelf, and all the code is designed by us in-house. So it's not something you can buy as a kit. And the problem is, the problem is today with today's platforms is how can you localize? How can you find out where you are in 3D space? So current methods are ex fairly expensive and uh, difficult to implement. So right now, GrassLab and ETH Zurich use what's called the Vicon system, or motion capture. And what this is, is it's an array of infrared cameras that circles a room, and you can only fly inside that room. So it really limits on where you can use your platform. Uh, GPS, but you're really limited to flying outdoors, since when you go inside, your signal diminishes and you can't use it. And currently, there's now uh, systems implementing the scanning laser rangefinder, as well as the Microsoft Connect. And these are fairly large uh, power requirement uh, devices as well as computation requirements. So you need a full computer on board. And so what we're doing is we're implementing a very low computation, low power on board approach, which is these infrared LEDs that we have installed here. So these are our two units. And what we do is we fly them in a leader follower configuration, which means that this leader is flown autonomously, or excuse me, remotely by a human. And this unit flies autonomously behind this and kind of follows the clear flight path that's, that's uh, provided by this unit. So on the leader, we have the infrared beacons that are installed here. And the system architecture is designed as follows up in the corner. So you have the main attitude controller. This is our stabilization controller that keeps the unit stable while you're flying it. You have our IMU, or initial measurement unit, which is the orientation sensor, which provides the yaw pitch and roll information to keep the unit stable. The wireless network, which connects not only the leader to the follower, but also to a base station for the user data. And you have the battery, motor controllers, and uh, motors installed, and there's four for the quad rotor. 
uh, for the leader, you also have a video camera that goes to a video receiver on the base station. And that's how the user can fly this remotely. Now, on the follower, the main difference is that instead of the infrared LEDs installed, what we have is we have an infrared camera, which is shown by Paul. So this camera is connected to an autopilot microcontroller shown here. And what this really allows us to do is kind of mimic the RC commands that are present on this unit to fly this one remotely and to fly it autonomously. So what it really is is a snap-on module that allows us to move the camera and autopilot microcontroller between the different units and allow them to fly behind this unit that's being flown by a user. And so this is a short video showing our units flying in a constrained environment. So during this flight, the PID or the proportional integral derivative control is running so that the unit is flying with the commands appropriate to where this one is in front of it. However, there is an user intervention just due to the system constraints as well as the environment so that we don't want to run into a wall. And these are just some short clips about how uh, capable our platform is. Uh, these are some videos outside in high winds as well as the onboard cameras that are present. And now Paul will talk about the MATLAB. So before we uh, implemented this on our actual hardware, um, we wanted to model it out, uh, we used MATLAB so that we didn't uh, injure any hardware, the hardware is pretty expensive, or so we didn't injure any people. Um, so in order to do this, we tried to simulate the real world as much as possible. So we, we simulate not only the onboard infrared camera, but also the uh, wireless link between the quad rotors and also the remote controller that the user has. So on these next slides, you'll see some compiled videos of the MATLAB model. Uh, in the bottom left is a black lead quadrotor with two red uh, following quadrotors behind it. This middle graph here, this is the instantaneous error that's obtained just by the distance formula. And you'll see that uh, at the 90 degree turn, for instance, the instantaneous error skyrockets. That's the hardest thing for the system to do. And then they'll fly away. You'll see the same thing here, but with five followers. And the idea is here is uh, what we talked about earlier, that we can expand this not only to two flying, but uh, to however many we want. And in fact, this is defined recursively. So you can just string them along. And one, one quad rotor's leader might be another's follower, uh, et cetera. So this is taken from that simulation. This is. Um, what Bill was talking about, uh, this is the control where we're trying to converge on a certain location. This again is from the simulation. Uh, the red line is at four meters that says I want to follow four meters behind the leader. And the blue line is the actual distance and it's trying to converge on the red line. And then you see it in response to the initial takeoff, the, the uh, initial pitch forward by the user and the pitch back. So just to briefly touch on the, the hardware, the architecture that we're using for this, Bill already talked about a little bit, but we have uh, a microcontroller and a wireless communication on the leader, and we have uh, two microcontrollers and wireless communication on the follower. And it turns out that we can't just use these IR beacons alone for the, uh, for the localization. In fact, we have, to, we have to fuse a variety of different uh, sensor data together in order to get the accurate localization. So that's what this block diagram is showing. We're taking in the attitude, the orientation of the leader that's sent wirelessly to the follower. We're taking in the IR camera data, it's near IR, um, of the, the position of the beacons that I see. And then I need also the um, orientation of the follower itself. And we can fuse all this together, filter, uh, et cetera, and then we get our actual localization, and then we can run controls on top of that. So this is experimental data. You'll notice it's not as clean as the MATLAB, that's to be expected, obviously. Uh, this black line is about 120 centimeters, and we're trying to converge on that. Uh, the red line on top is, um, is the actual displacement. The blue line below it is our response to that displacement. In this case, this, this is pitch. So this, this means if I'm back by uh, two meters, for example, and I need to increase, then I'll pitch forward so that I increase. And so you see a corresponding pitch forward for every positive displacement. Uh, so we're going to do a short demo. We're not going to spin them up right now, um, but we're going to show the, uh, in real time, the localization scheme. 
so what we're using for this is just a simple Python script. Okay. So after about 10 seconds of initialization, the, uh, <coughs> you should be able to see the IR beacons on the follower. So you'll see uh, the two blue are the uh, two beacons and the red X in between is a low pass. It's just a filtered centroid, the center of the two beacons. So as we move the system around, you'll see that as we move in the X direction, our X displacement increases and decreases. We have our Y displacement, which is lateral, and then our Z displacement, which is vertical. So combine this information, we know where we are in 3D space relative to the unit that's flown remotely. In addition, we have a servo correcting for the pitch displacement on this unit. So as I pitch it up and down, it corrects for that, as well as the rotation on this unit. So in conclusion, we've come up with four main bullet points that we want to end this project with. It's first that we've designed a leader follower system for tracking and control, which basically means that flying a lead unit remotely, we're able to know where we are in 3D space relative to it and act appropriately. So command the right uh, responses to move in the same position or behind it as it's flown. In addition, localization is a really difficult issue. Uh, current platforms have really not been able to solve it completely. Uh, as you see in the Vicon system is the uh, current system that's able to provide millimeter accuracy. However, it's limited to a room and you can't just use it outdoors. Uh, so what we designed is a cooperative sensor fusion to take information from each of the sensors and combine it to give our localization. Uh, our payload capacity is approximately 800 grams and we designed uh, different modules that you can actually just kind of snap on and plug into the microcontroller. So we have uh, microphones, thermal sensors, a thermal imager, so you can actually scan a room for a, a thermal uh, scan, uh, excuse me, image. And lastly, our system is open source in design, so both the hardware and software is able to be replicated. And what we have is on our website, at the top, we actually have a list of what parts we use and where you can buy them. And in addition to that, we actually have a SVN repository of our code so that that's able to be downloaded currently. And what this has allowed us to do is kind of have a global impact. So we've had more than 1,000 people from 73 different countries that have looked at our website and tested the code. And we've actually had uh, feedback from them about how they're using it in their systems and their research. And with that, we thank you for your time, and we'll open for questions.